Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we're looking at Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So today will be the last lecture on this particular text and we'll look at two sections and compare and contrast the two sections in terms of how that inform the larger narrative that we talked about in the text, the narrative imperialism, exploitation, human greed and also alienation, commodification and alienation, the two symptoms which emerge out of merciless capitalism and merciless imperialism which is a context in this particular story, which is one of Belgian ivory imperialism in Congo, as you know. So we're just looking at a section where Kurtz dies in Heart of Darkness. Uh, so that section needs to be studied in some detail in terms of what Kurtz says before he dies and what could that symbolically signify. Because, you know, a large part of this novel is about symbolic signification. Uh, there aren't many literal things in this novel, so uh, we're not really looking for a story over here. We're looking for symptoms, we're looking for psychological conditions, we're looking for emotional conditions. So as a result of which, those of you who have read the entire novel would know, it's a very, very difficult novel to read. Uh, it slows you down as a reader, it decelerates you, it defamiliarizes you. And as you mentioned already, uh, this idea of deceleration and defamiliarization are very uh, deliberate narrative techniques used by uh, Joseph Conrad in terms of looking at the cognitive condition which Heart of Darkness uh, dramatizes. Okay, so it's not really telling you a story. In that sense, it's an anti-story, it's an anti-novel. And a large part of Marlowe's anxiety as a narrator is because he can't put his experience into a story and he says that over and over again that it's impossible to tell, to convert my experience into a narrative which would be meaningful to a European audience and that lack of meaningfulness, uh, the slight absurdity, the danger of absurdity is something which lurks in the story all the time. Now let's look at Kurtz's dying scene, the scene in How the Darkness where Kurtz dies and what does it say right before he dies and that one little line, it's sort of packed with a lot of meanings and which is something which, is, which keeps coming up over and over again in any reading of Heart of Darkness and also the uh, different adaptations of Heart of Darkness as we've seen. Okay, so, um, and this, this is where Marlowe is talking about Kurtz and the entire novel of course is focalized through Marlowe. So we see the entire experience as focalized through Marlowe's brain. So Marlowe is a prism, Marlowe is a camera, the movie camera uh, through which we see the story unfold in Heart of Darkness. So this is what he says and this should be on his screen. I saw in that ivory face the expression of somber pride, of ruthless power, of craven terror, of an intense and hopeless despair. Did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation and surrender during the supreme moment of complete knowledge? Right, so look at the contrast, a series of contrasts going on over here. So it's, it's got power, it's got terror, it's got pride, all put together. Uh, and it's also got hopeless despair. So in, in that sense, Heart of Darkness, what it does to Kurtz is that it, it fills him with power and in the process it makes him hollow. So the filling in of power is also a process of making, uh, you know, hollow. It's also a process of liquidation, of exhaustion, right? So power over here becomes a very deceptive instrument, a very deceptive category over here, which uh, Kurtz uh, embodies. Uh, it's a very paradoxical uh, category. So he becomes powerful, but at the same time he's uh, liquidated by power. His existential self goes completely uh, liquidated or, you know, is, is completely exhausted with the entire arrival invasion of power. Okay, so did he live his life again in every detail of desire, temptation and surrender during the supreme moment of complete knowledge? So this entire knowledge, the complete knowledge of imperialism, the complete knowledge of his own self as having been consumed by imperialism is a supreme moment uh, that Kurtz embodies. He cried in a whisper at some image, at some vision. He cried out twice, a cry that was no more than a breath. And what was the cry? The horror, the horror. Now that's a very often quoted line from Heart of Darkness, the horror, the horror. And what does Kurtz mean by this? Uh, what does Kurtz um, signify when he says these things? The horror, the horror is obviously the horror of imperialism as seen by someone who becomes the instrument of imperialism. So Kurtz, of course, is a perfect instrument of imperialism, but at the same time, he becomes a threat because it becomes too perfect. Uh, so he completely appropriates and internalizes imper imperialism to the extent that he becomes ivory. And you find how the ivory image is used over and over again to characterize Kurtz, 
right? So he becomes the tool, he becomes the commodity, he becomes the instrument, he becomes the material that is a signifier of imperialism over here. Okay? So the image, the, the particular line, the horror, the horror becomes a moment of self-acknowledgement. He's acknowledging his own hollowness, he's acknowledging his own uh, surrender uh, to the power of imperialism. And he uses the word surrender quite um, ironically because he notionally is a powerful man. Uh, theoretically, he's a white imperialist, he's an all-powerful figure. But what he, what he realizes through becoming powerful, the process of becoming powerful, is that this, this process of power is actually something which annihilates them, something which consumes them, right? So when you consume power, it consumes you back. And that's the horror that Kurtz is talking about over here, the horror of hollowness, the horror of understanding that entire life that he spent as a human being uh, has been at the service of uh, in a process of commodification, a process of exploitation, a process of merciless exploitation. And that is the image of horror, that's the knowledge of horror that uh, Kurtz is uh, crying out over here. So interestingly, how the darkness is about enlightenment, uh, but the enlightenment is one not of illumination, it's one of darkness. So you get the knowledge of your darkness, you get the knowledge of your nothingness uh, to a certain extent, right? And that paradoxically is what gives you uh, the only redeemable meaning about it, like that you actually, actually know that you are nothing, that you are consumed by nothingness. Uh, that becomes only uh, the sole redeeming figure in Kurtz, the fact that he, actually, he ends up actually knowing the horror of imperialism. He doesn't become a fool, he doesn't really live a life of a fool. He wakes up and realizes what he's done uh, is that of an act of horror because it's become an act of exploitation but also one of self-consumption. So it has this sort of quasi-cannibalistic quality, imperialism and heart of darkness. It, it cannibalizes uh, Kurtz, it, it makes him eat himself up uh, existentially and also materially. So he becomes a lean, eaten out man. So there's this image of having been eaten out, having been annihilated by power. And that becomes the signifier of horror over here. The fact of the knowledge of exploitation, the knowledge of nothingness, the knowledge of annihilation, self-annihilation. That's what he cries out twice, the horror, the horror. I blew the candle and candle out and left the cavern. So again, it's very, very cinematic. So if you look at the visual narrative in Heart of Darkness, it's very cinematic in quality. So it could say it's the horror, the horror, and then it dies. That's his dying word. And then immediately after, Marlowe blows the candle out and leaves the cavern. The pilgrims were dining in the mess room and I took my place opposite the manager who lifted his eyes to give me a questioning glance, which I successfully ignored. He leaned back, serene, with that peculiar smile of his, feeling the unexpressed depth of his meanness. A continuous shower of small flies streamed upon the lamb, upon the cloth, upon her hands and faces. Suddenly, the manager's boy put his insolent black head in the doorway and said in a tone of scathing contempt, Mr. Kutz, he dead. Now, this particular line again is very loaded. It's the only time uh, a non-European speaks in Heart of Darkness, uh, uh, you know, an, an African speaks in Heart of Darkness. And obviously he speaks in very broken and stilted English, Mr. Kutz, he dead. There's no verb, uh, there's no sense of sophistication, it's just conveying an image, it's conveying a message uh, in very, very broken English. And that is part of the uh, very racist rhetoric uh, used by Marlowe and of course by Conrad in the context of his times uh, to talk about the Africans and how the African appropriates English to convey a message. So Kutz's dying report comes to them uh, through this manager's boy. Uh, you know, who just puts this insolent black head. So again, if you look at the adjective, insolent black head, uh, very, very racially loaded. Uh, it's very racist by modern standards. The black head is just an object uh, who comes to convey an image, convey a message. That's it. There's no degree of humanization. There's no degree of categorization given to that person. He just becomes a very, very uh, convenient and effective messenger, uh, an African messenger who comes and delivers a broken message with his insolent black head. So the degree of objectification and reduction is very, very important for us to understand. And of course, objectification or reification is a process that, that operates through reduction. So it reduces certain things. Uh, it's a very metonymy process where the entire body, the entire human being is converted into a body and that entire body is converted into a small image. In this, this case, it's an image of the head, the insolent black head who comes in and delivers the message and goes away. Okay? So that's the entire image of Kurtz dying. And as you can see, uh, we've discussed it already, there's something very, very spectral about Kurtz, a very shadowy, very ghostly, very spectral about Kurtz. He doesn't really uh, get fully fleshed out as a person. We don't quite know uh, the entire background of Kurtz. We have very metonymic information about him. The father is half German, half Russian, and the entire Europe you know, went in the making of Kurtz, which is to say he becomes the European man, the European imperialist. Uh, so his 
cracking up, uh, his going native, uh, uh, his regeneration into something which is uh, a threat to the empire, becomes a very, very dangerous regeneration because it shows that even the best of Europe, even the best Europe in mind, even the finest specimen of Europe in masculinity uh, can become degenerate in the African wilderness. Right? So, the African wilderness, of course, is very exotic. Uh, is very essentialized over here and is obviously feminized. It's something which consumes the perfect white man, the perfect logical white man. Even he is not, uh, uh, you know, impregnable against this kind of uh, seduction of the African wilderness. Right. So the entire rhetoric in *Heart of Darkness* becomes very racist in quality. It becomes very racially inflected. Of course, we have all the series of Africans who are completely dehumanized, and the only person who speaks is the person who comes in and points his insolent head and just delivers Mr. Kutsi dead. Right. So you know the whole idea of the African being reduced to a certain image, a certain stereotype, a certain racist stereotype, which is rampant in *Heart of Darkness*. Now, the reason why uh, I have. Uh, a slight reservation in calling Heart of Darkness an out and out racist novel is that it is actually very, very ambivalent towards imperialism, right? So it doesn't really glorify imperialism at all. And not just that, it doesn't really glorify the white man. So the white man in Heart of Darkness is someone who's a bit of an idiot. He doesn't quite know what's happening. He's completely confused about you know, what's around him politically, cognitively. He just becomes an embodiment of confusion. And you know, he becomes an unknown, uh, it becomes a very, very small instrument in the entire machinery of imperialism, white imperialism. So Marlon Heart of Darkness is hardly a hero. And Kurtz, of course, is more of a hero, but then he becomes the anti hero in that sense because he becomes a threat, he becomes a danger, he becomes a degenerate in Heart of Darkness. It's something which is uh, you know, dramatized over and over again. Now, the next scene which I'm going to jump cut into in Heart of Darkness is the final scene where Marlow comes back to Belgium and goes to Kurtz's intended, the fiance of Kurtz. And interestingly, if you take a look at the two female figures in Heart of Darkness, Kurtz's mistress in Africa, who is exotic, uh, who is, you know, excessive, exotic and who was very, very bodied. Uh, so, the entire characterization of the Kutz's intender mistress in Africa uh, is used through bodily markers. So, you know, it's very, very fleshy and mutable and hysteric. Uh, and in all this racist, sexist stereotypes which are used, uh, is hyper, she's hypersexualized and, and a characterization. In complete contrast to which, we have the very, very somber, magnificent uh, and very, very withdrawn female figure of Kurtz's intended or fiance, who is obviously this white, white woman uh, who is very elegant, who is mourning Kurtz is dead, uh, using a proper mourning costume. So, she comes dressed up as a mourner, she is very elegant and she has got all these uh, very, very stereotypically white, elegant female markers which he used to categorize her. Now, it, ob it actually gets more complex than that. It does not really stay at the level of this blunt binary and we will see in a moment how uh, Conrad actually makes it more complex because when Marlow comes back to Belgium, uh, he's expected to deliver a report, a posthumous report about Kurtz. And the only report that he can deliver is that Kurtz died as a hero. Kurtz died as a white hero, as a white man who is very, very glorious in his quality. And that's the only message that he can deliver uh, to Kurtz's intended. So, the point is he cannot tell Kurtz's intended what really transpired, what really happened in the African wilderness that Kurtz became degenerate, that Kurtz became uh, you know, a merciless mercenary, uh, you know, who turned his back to the empire, who actually became a problem to the empire and who had to be essentially you know, exterminated. Uh, so, he can't tell that report, he can't give the authentic report uh, to the European insider. And interestingly, the European insider happens to be Kurtz's intended, the female figure. So, it actually becomes a broader narrative. What it actually shows us is that when the, the, the white man comes back uh, from the, uh, you know, the, the site of conflict, he cannot deliver the authentic report, he cannot deliver the truthful report. He has to lie, he has to conform uh, to the consumed narrative of glorification, civilization, heroism, etc. And if we take a look at that, little narrative. It is something which is very, very correct geopolitically uh, given the current tensions we have in the world today, where you know when soldiers for instance come back from certain sites of geopolitical conflict, whether it is the Middle East or other parts of the world, uh, they are not expected, they are not allowed uh, to actually tell what really transpired, which is the horror of the world, the horror of exploitation, the horror of merciless exploitation. Uh, so, in that sense, uh, the entire uh, image of the soldier is one of heroism, is one of self-sacrifice, is one of commitment uh, towards a greater goal, whether the greater goal of fighting terrorism, the greater goal is uh, establishing civilization, etc. But the point is, uh, any site of conflict which has soldiers, which has human beings 
in it. Uh, you know, it also comes with a set of constraints, right? When, in, in, a, in a sense that soldiers can't come back and tell what really happened. And we can think of uh, situations even closer to home, where soldiers were sent back from the enemy camps. Uh, they just become a, a symbolic instrument uh, to go down a particular narrative. So a soldier can't really speak, the soldiers aren't allowed, not given the agency to speak out, to really transpire, to really tell what really transpired in that particular setting. So Marlowe, in that sense, becomes uh, one of the earliest figures in fiction of the man who comes back from a site of conflict but cannot really tell what happened, what cannot really tell what really happened to the European insider who happens to be obviously a, a woman, a female figure, uh, who can only consume the glorious narrative, the heroic narrative, the, the glamorous narrative about uh, imperialism being a civilizing mission. Okay, so that's the entire setting uh, in which that particular scene takes place. So let's just go there and see how that uh, you know, is described in How to Darkness. Okay, so uh, so this is the image uh, of Cruz's intended. Uh, this is the image that you know when Marla meets Cruz's fiance in, in in Belgium, in Brussels, presumably. This is what you know the entire scene is described as, and uh, you know she and this is a description that should be on the screen at the moment. She struck me as beautiful. I mean, she had a beautiful expression. I know that a sunlight, uh, you know, can be a light too, yet one felt that there's no manipulation of light and pose could be conveyed, could have conveyed a delicate shade of truthfulness upon those features. She seemed ready to listen without mental reservation, without suspicion, without a thought for herself. I concluded that I would go and give her back the portrait of those letters myself. So look at the way in which, uh, you know, Kurtz is intended as described using markers of beauty, restraint, discipline, uh, elegance, etc., in complete contrast to the excessive markers uh, that were used to describe uh, Kurtz's African mistress. Okay, so that 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 binary is interestingly uh, conveyed over here. Okay, and now if you take a look at the very performative quality of mourning that takes place in Heart of Darkness, when she appears, she turns up before Marlowe dressed as a mourner, a very elegant mourner. Uh, it's very elegant and very very uh, elegant. Uh, but before that, just take a look at uh, some of the material signifiers in How to Darkness. Just before, and this is the image uh, of Marlo waiting for the fiancé to come, uh, presumably in her house, uh, and, you know, and she's just looking around and seeing what's around him. And this is what's around him. And this should be on the screen. The dusk was falling. I had to wait in a lofty drawing room with three long windows from floor to ceiling that were like three luminous and bed-draped columns. The bent gilt legs and backs of the furniture shone in indistinct curves. The tall marble fireplace had a cold and monumental whiteness. A grand piano stood massively in a corner with, with dark gleams on the flat surfaces like a somber and polished uh, sarcophagus. A high door opened close arrows. So, you know, the whole idea of the uh, polished uh, sarcophagus and before that a grand piano and before that a marble fireplace, very, very European signifiers of nobility. Uh, of very, very solid European bourgeoisie, uh, that kind of a setting, right? So, you know, it's like very, very privileged, markers of wealth, markers of privilege, markers of whiteness, uh, for the matter. And that's an old white space, and all these markers are also very, very white, which is a complete contrast uh, to the delayed decoding that Malu experienced in Africa and Congo, where he didn't have a clue, cognitively speaking, of what was around him, whether it was arrows coming at him, whether it's River Congo, whether it was, he was being attacked by people, he had no clue. And now contrast that to the very, very solid material markers of wealth and privilege that Malu is experiencing over here. And now we have a scene in which Kurtz's intended comes and you know, gets a report from Malo about uh, you know, Kurtz, Kurtz dying. And then the question she would ask him is, what were his dying words? And this is something which will become very, very dramatic. She came forward, all in black, with a pale head floating towards me in the dusk. She was in mourning. It was more than a year since his death, more than a year since the news came. She seemed as though she would remember and mourn forever. She took both my hands in hers and murmured, I had heard that you were coming. I noticed she was not very young, uh, I mean not girlish. She had a mature capacity for fidelity, for belief, for suffering. The room seemed to have grown darker, as if the sad light of the cloudy evening had taken refuge on her forehead. This fair hair, this pale visage, this pure brow seemed surrounded by an ashy halo from which her dark eyes looked out on me. The glance was guileless, profound, confident and trustful. She carried her sorrowful head as though she were proud of that sorrow, as though she would say, I alone knew, know how to mourn for him as it deserves. So there's a degree of pride about the mourning over here. It's been more than a year, but we're told that she's still mourning for him because it seems to be the elegant, romantic thing to do. 
Okay, uh, but now the questions that Marlow is subjected to become very, very interesting. And she tells Marlow, and this should be on the screen, you knew him well, she murmured after a moment of moaning silence. Intimacy grows quickly out there, I said, I knew him as well as is possible for one man to know another. And you admired him, she said. It was impossible to know him and not to admire him, was it? He was a remarkable man. And look at the rhetorical quality of the question. It is impossible to know him and not admire him, was it? So the, the answer is embedded in the question already. And that's, that's a part of the entire narrative over here. Malu doesn't have an option to say no. Malu doesn't have an option or the agency to give the authentic report. He cannot really say to her that Kurtz was a merciless mercenary. Kurtz was an exploiter. He can't say that. He has to confirm to the narrative that a white man in the colony, in the empire, in the wilderness of the empire, must be a glamorous hero, must be someone worth admiration. That's, that's the only narrative available to him uh, as, a, as a reporter of the empire, as a reporter of the horrors of the empire. And they realize the heart of darkness, they realize the, the darkness in the heart of darkness, the fact that he cannot convey the real knowledge, he cannot convey the real experience to the European insider. Okay? He was a remarkable man. I said unsteadily that before the appealing fixity of a gaze that seemed to watch for more words on my lips, I went on. It was impossible not to love him, she finished eagerly, silencing me into an appalled dumbness. So again, look at the way in which the narrative is already constructed, right? So she already knows, she has already said the narrative that it's impossible not to love him. So Malu can't even complete his sentences. He doesn't even have the agency to complete his sentence. So he says it was impossible not to and then she fills in by saying, love him, right? So, you know, Kurtz must be lovable. Kurtz must be admirable. Kurtz must be someone worthy of reveration, worthy of worship all the time. And it's very, very important for the purpose, for the broader narrative of the empire, that a white man must always be worthy of admiration because he's, that's his job as a white man. He's civilizing that. So what this particular scene uh, reveals very, very interestingly is the lack of agency suffered by Marlow. He can't really tell, he's not allowed to tell what really happened. Even before he finishes the sentence, uh, adjectives are filled in for him by the, uh, by the intended of Kurtz. Okay, <clears throat> how true, how true. But when you think that no one knew him so well as I, I had all this noble confidence, I knew him best. Okay, and now uh, the real question uh, comes uh, when he asks Malu, uh, you know, the, the question that, you know, what was his dying words? Okay, and this is what she asked him. Uh, it is impossible that all this should be lost, that such a life should be sacrificed to leave nothing but sorrow. You know what vast plans he had. I knew of them too. I could not perhaps understand, but others knew, that, knew of them. So again, look at the sexism over here, the embedded innate internalized sexism, that a white man knows things that a woman can't. Uh, he had great, pl great plans, grand plans that I as a woman have no access to. But then I understand how great he is. That's the entire narrative dished out over here. I could not perhaps understand, but others knew of him. Something must remain. His words, at least, have not died. His words will remain, I said. Of course, Mother means the words that he heard, the horror, the horror. And there's a dramatic irony over here at play. We know, Mother knows, but she doesn't know. But the more sinister thing is, she doesn't want to know. Uh, she wants to know the consumed truth. She wants to know the commonly consumed truth, which is Kurtz must be a hero, Kurtz must be a romantic hero, Kurtz must be the perfect agent of the empire, right? So no other interpretation, no other narrative is allowed, okay? Right. Uh, and this is the, uh, this is the, in the question, the dramatic question that uh, the, the intendant asked Marlowe. Uh, I heard, Malu says, I heard his very last words. I stopped in a fright. So look at the, um, the, the, the neurotic quality of Malu over here. He's very, very neurotic. I stopped in a fright. I heard his very last words. And of course, we know the last words of so the horror, the horror. And that's what's freezing him. He can't even re-experience it. It was so horrifying for him. Repeat them, she murmured in a heartbroken tone. I want, I want something, something to live with. So she wants to latch on uh, to the commonly consumed narrative of the romantic hero, the romantic white man who died in the non-white space. So she wants Marlow to repeat the words. I was on the point of crying at her. Don't you hear them? The dust was repeating them in a persistent whisper all around us, in a whisper that seemed to swell menacingly like the first whisper of a rising world. The horror, the horror, that was a dying word. And everything around him, the atmosphere around him was screaming that to Marlow. He was re-experiencing that, the entire uh, experience of hearing the words, the horror, the horror. His last words, his last word uh, to live with, she insisted. 
Don't you understand? I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. Look at the performative quality over here, the performative quality of mourning, the, the, the very stereotypical romantic narrative. I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. There's a crescendo to it. There's a climatic quality to it. And it's like she's telling Marlowe what to say. And Marlowe doesn't have any other option apart from saying what she wants to hear. So she becomes a very, very you know, interesting symbol of the European insider who consumes uh, the normative narrative of imperialism being the white man's civilizing mission, being the white man's glorifying mission, being the white man's heroic mission. Anything apart from that will not do for her. Okay, so I loved him, I loved him, I loved him. It's reaching a crescendo and it's pushing Marlow towards telling, you know, what she wants to hear. And of course, she being the European insider over here. I pulled myself together and spoke slowly. The last word he pronounced was your name. Right? So this is a romantic report, the posthumous romantic report that Marlowe is forced to deliver to Chris's intended. Right? But it's a double irony over here, as uh, I'm sure you know, you would understand right now. The fact that Ma Kurtz actually said the horror, the horror, and Marlowe cannot say that to the European insider. Therein lies the horror. So when Marlowe says to Kurtz's intended, the last words he died with was a romantic word, your name, and he died with your name. In that sense, he's actually right, because she is a horror. And what Kurtz may have meant, along with many things, uh, among other things, is the misinformation consumed by the European insider. The misinformation that is, you know, forcibly consumed by the European insider about imperialism, about imperialism being a grand, noble, romantic thing. So in that sense, her name, or the symptom that she stands for, or the symbolic significance that she embodies, is the horror that Kurtz had died with. So in that sense, it, it is actually is a truthful report, but of course that's lost in her because uh, she's forcibly consuming, <coughs> excuse me, the romantic report that she wants to consume. So it's a very, very complex narrative at play over here. Kurtz had died with the words, the horror, the horror, which is about the hollowness of imperialism, the hollowness, the cannibalistic quality of imperialism and that effect it has on the white man. Uh, it makes him a beast, makes him a mercenary, makes him an instrument, uh, completely dehumanizes him. And the knowledge of dehumanization, that is a horror in Heart of Darkness. And when Marlowe comes back to Brussels, uh, he is forced to tell a romantic report, to give a romantic report to Chris's elegant mourner, uh, elegant fiancé. And he can't tell anything apart from, you know, what she wants to hear, which is, you know, he died with your name on his lips, which is a very romantic report about, you know, uh, uh, the noble man dying with the in the word of the, with the name of the, the loved one uh, who was the insider over here. But the macro narrative over here is interesting because that is part of the horror. When her name becomes a horror because she stands for the horror. She stands for the misinformation. She stands for the complete ignorance about imperialism. Uh, the very forcible and very, very uh, consumed ignorance, the very, very happily consumed ignorance about imperialism. The imperialism is a noble thing, a romantic thing, etc. So her uh, complete disengagement, her complete refusal to engage with the reality of imperialism is part of the horror in Heart of Darkness. Okay, so that's something that I just wanted to spend some time with. Okay, <clears throat> uh, and that's the end of the novel, but just before it ends, uh, you know, Marla goes on to say that she knew she was sure. Right, so the script is ready beforehand. The script is predestined. It's pre-scripted. Marlow has no agency whatsoever in terms of telling what really transpired. He can only deliver the report which is already there. The report about the white man's glory. The report about the white man's heroism. That's the only report available to him as a narrator in *Heart of Darkness*. So this becomes obviously part of the narrative crisis in Heart of Darkness. And you can see how, hopefully by now, how the narrative crisis and the existential crisis in Heart of Darkness are linked to each other. The fact that Marlowe can't tell the story, he is not allowed to tell the story, and if he does want to tell the story, he can't really have the narrative frame to tell people what really happened. And that narrative crisis, the fact that he has to lie to Kurtz's intended, he has to misinform the European insider. And also because, you know, even if he wants to inform him, he doesn't have the narrative structure to tell what really happened. That narrative crisis makes him neurotic, right? So there's a very interesting relationship between narrative and neurosis in Heart of Darkness, as I'm sure some of you can do further research on. And the, the article of mine that I mentioned in one of the lectures today actually deals with it. So if you want to read it, do Google me up. It should be available against my name, especially my academic or uh, accounts. I've uploaded it so you can download it from there and read it if you want to. It deals exactly with this relationship between narrative and neurosis and heart of darkness. Okay, so um, and then Marlowe goes on to say that, you know, could I have said her, told her the truth? But I couldn't, I could not tell her. It would have been too dark, 
too dark altogether, right? So again, I must misinform the European insider because otherwise they can't consume, they can't take, they can't handle so much darkness. So the European whiteness must be retained. And the whiteness, of course, is a big lie. It's a big sham, as all of you would know over here. And that's the whole point of heart of darkness. It just, it, it exposes the entire whiteness, the constructive whiteness as a big sham, a spectacular sham, right? So it'll be impossible to tell Cruz's intent of what really happened, what were his dying words, because that would have been too dark, too dark altogether. That would that completely crush the entire constructive imperialism as being the white man's civilizing mission. And this cynicism, this darkness in Heart of Darkness, is exactly what makes it a very complex text, uh, despite its racism, despite its reductionism, despite its uh, rampant racism uh, with which the non-Europeans non are described away, the completely dehumanized, not given a voice. But despite all that, uh, the cynicism and the discomfort that it dramatizes about imperialism is what makes it a very, very important novel, a very relevant novel about us today. And finally, one little image uh, which stands out, Marlowe seized and sat apart indistinct and silent in the pose of a meditating Buddha. So again, if you remember the final, the, the initial image, uh, there was a, there's an image of a bronze Buddha with which Marlowe was described. And, and again, the Buddha image comes back in the pose of a meditating Buddha. So he's the Messiah, he's a wise man over here. But the interesting thing is his enlightenment is not one of illumination. His enlightenment is one of darkness. And more complexly, he can't convey the darkness. He can't really tell what the darkness is all about. So he, in a sense, is a flawed messiah. He's a flawed prophet. Uh, he's an important prophet. He's not really a Buddha in that sense. He just becomes a caricature of Buddha. He just becomes a caricature of the all-seeing, all-wise all prophet. He is not really that. He, he poses like that, and that's the important word over here, in the pose of a meditating Buddha. So he's just a very shallow mimicry of the prophet. Uh, he knows the knowledge. He has the knowledge. He has epiphany, but he has, doesn't have the instrument to convey it. He doesn't have the power to convey it. And therein lies the powerlessness of Malu as a prophet. He's a very powerless prophet in that sense. He knows the evil of imperialism. He knows the sham of white imperialism, but he cannot convey it completely. And that makes Heart of Darkness uh, a very, very complex novel. This inability to convey uh, a very, very problematic, a politically problematic and existentially problematic experience. Nobody moved for a time. We've lost the first of the ebb, said the director suddenly. I raised my head. The offing was barred by the, blank, by the black bank of clouds and the tranquil waterway leading to the uttermost ends of the earth flowed somber under the overcast sky, seemed to lead into the heart of an immense darkness. So the, the final atmospheric condition in the heart of darkness, it sort of connects Thames with the Congo. Uh, in that sense, you know, the, the two rivers symbolically merge with each other. So the White River, the river of civilization, the river of enlightenment, the river of trade, it actually becomes uh, the river of a heart of immense darkness. So in that sense, in the Thames and Congo merge into each other very, very symbolically. So with that, we come to the end of the novel. As you can see, it's a very complex novel. And as I keep mentioning, it's one of the novels which keeps getting relevance. You know, it has renewed relevance in the world we live in today, especially in the geopolitical tensions and crises that we have in the world today, where you're not allowed to say what really happened to you. Uh, you just, you're just allowed to misinform. That's the only information available to you. Uh, and the information that you gather, uh, you cannot really tell that into a narrative. You cannot put that into a narrative. You cannot really tell about what happened to you in a particular side of conflict. Uh, so this entire compulsory misinformation that uh, the Heart of Darkness dramatizes at the end, or the lie, the political lie in Heart of Darkness about imperialism being a glorious enterprise, being a romantic enterprise, uh, whereas actually, you know, exposing imperialism as a sham, as an exploitation, uh, that dichotomy is very, very politically significant, especially in the world today. The, the difference between what is reported and what is actually, you know, experienced is something which we see over and over again in different geopolitical settings, uh, settings in the world that we see today, you know, globally, you know, in terms of crisis, in terms of conflict, how the darkness remains a novel in fiction, it's a, it's a work in fiction, but it becomes very, very topical and relevant, especially in relation to these kind of crisis narratives that we consume globally uh, in the world we live in today. So that we come to the end of How the Darkness and I hope you got some interesting points out of it, interesting uh, thoughts out of it and I've just been a bit careful in terms of giving you some ideas which might inform your research uh, on this novel. It's one of the novels which I've researched on endlessly. It just opens up to all kinds of interpretations. It's modernist, it's late Victorian, it's uh, in a very, very you know, 
both colonial in that sense as well. And also it's a novel about you know, conflict, it's a novel about man's negotiation with conflict, nervous negotiation with conflict and it's a very interesting novel about conflict and narrative. How do you put a narrative to a conflict uh, and the difficulty uh, and the you know, impossibility of narrating the conflict and the almost illegality of it, you know, it's not legally allowed to you to tell what happened in a particular side of conflict and that becomes part of the human crisis on Heart of Darkness which as I mentioned is very interestingly relevant to the world we live in today. Thank you for your attention.